Thank you, Steve, for this generous introduction. And thank you, ANFA, for having me. I love neuroscience, obviously, but I also love architecture. And I think the biggest proof of my love of architecture is that when I was a uh, newly minted assistant professor with like barely two pennies to rub together, my husband and I hired an, uh, an architect to build a little house we decided instead of um, you know, buying a cookie cutter bigger house that it was more important to have an architect, architect designed house. And we continued to have a relationship with that architect as we expanded, remodeled and so on. And, but I've also been involved, I, I've volunteered on every architecture committee at our university, dealt with the late Venturi uh, and and Denise Brown. I've interacted with many architects over the years. I hustle invitations to the Pritzker Architecture Prize, which I'm, I get very excited about. So uh, I, I, I love both sides of AMFA, and I was very excited. The first time I heard about it was from Rusty Gage, and I thought it was a fabulous idea. So it's a great honor for me to be here talking to you. Although the subject matter is actually not so uplifting, but I think it's important. So I am going to be talking to you about um, solitary confinement in particular, which I see as being, of course, primarily a law issue, but there is neuroscience and architecture that could play a role in how we approach it. And when you think about solitary confinement, it's just like the, the the first reaction is it's inhumane, it doesn't make any sense to me that not only, not, not that we, some people need to be separated, that I understand some people have to, but that it has to be done under conditions like that, that are depicted here. And people who come out of this are, a lot of people never come out of it, some of them are really hurt very badly. The problem is causing a lot of uh, soul searching, I think, in the hearts and minds of many responsible citizens of this country. We do it a lot more in the United States than pretty much any part of the Western world. And, you know, it needs to be thought about a little differently. Hence this quote from Einstein about how we can't think the same way in order to solve the problem. And this is where Maybe science has something to say about this problem. Now, when I started in being involved in this, I really didn't think I had anything to, to say or add except what I just told you, like, of course, now we, we could do better than this. But, and there is a lot we don't know because the perfect studies have not been done in this area for reasons I will touch on. But my argument has, changed and I have come to believe that even incomplete knowledge could be informative and it might help in addressing the situation and I hope I will tell you how that will happen. And basically this is the bottom line, that based on what we know there is little question that extended solitary confinement damages the brain. This is important to say brain damage as opposed to psychological hurt. And I will tell you why in a second. So this is how this whole thing started. This uh, gentleman, Jules Lobel, is a professor at Pittsburgh uh, uh, Law and is also the head of the Center for Constitutional Right, which addresses issues about constitutional rights. And he was in charge of a team that was taking on the case of Pelican Bay Prison, which is in California where there had been riots and hunger strikes um, in back in 2013, especially because of human right violations, especially because people lived in unbelievably bad conditions. The hunger strike actually spread all over the country. But one of the issues that these people talked about is the fact that many, many people were in very, very extended solitary confinement. And this is a rendition of what a room looks like in those conditions. It has a four inch slit to an inner courtyard. So there's still no real light. And everything is built with cement 
Um, so nothing is movable, everything is hard. The water comes on intermittently because they don't want anybody to flood. And as if this was not constraining enough, there is a cage to remind you that you could be even caged further in a narrower area. This whole thing is the size of about a king size bed. Some people have lived there a quarter, quarter of a century. So I'm going forward here. So the case came along, the case, the Ashker is one of the people who went on strike in Pelican Bay. And the, fi the, the case got filed in 2012, but it took several years for the settlement to happen. And during that period, one of the things that they wanted to argue is that it was cruel and unusual punishment. But it turns out that in American law, psychological harm is not cruel and unusual. People argue that the point is to cause psychological distress. Why are you otherwise imprisoning people? So it was important to actually show that it was causing physical harm to the brain. Now, those of us in neuroscience, you know, see no hard divide between the brain and emotions and behavior and thoughts and feelings and moods and, th and all of that. But in law, it turns out to be a critical issue. And so um, they needed to argue that it caused brain harm. And this is why they called on some neuroscientists to be involved and created a an argument uh, saying that it was actually physically harmful to them. All of it was indirect because nobody had actually taken people before and after looked at their brain and proven that. So I'm gonna give you the kind of evidence that we can present to say that it causes harm to the brain. In, so they won, technically they won, but Sadly, the way the system worked it is they moved them from solitary to something called level four prison. They're still in isolation 22 to 24 hours a day. And when they're not isolated, it means there's a guard that comes out, take you sometimes what you have still chains on to walk up and down a hallway. I think they're supposed to see a little more light than they used to before. They used to call a vent to the outside world outside air, and so, you know, we're, we're talking about now splitting hairs, but the battle is still very much on and in this state as well as all over the country. Uh, in the process of being involved in the background of this case, I met this gentleman, Robert Hillary King. King spent 32 years in Angola prison in Louisiana. Of those 29 years, he was in solitary. Just imagine, do you know somebody who's 29 years old? That whole lifetime. And he wrote this book called The Bottom of the Heap about it. He was part of a group called the Angola Three, who are Robert King, Albert Wood Fox, and Herman Wallace, and Wood Fox, so they, they, the two of them were avowed Black Panther, he claims he wasn't, but he was interacting with them back then. He had been arrested not for a murder or anything. He had held up a, a store and, you know, and gotten some alcohol or something as a kid, a 20-year-old kid. And so he was in jail. He started in prison. He started interacting with them. They decided that he was unsafe. They put him in solitary. Eventually, it was overturned, and he was released, and he's been helping you know, raise consciousness about this issue. I met these people in various conferences. One is in Pittsburgh here. So um, they, this is, again, Jules Lobel and a, uh, another lawyer. And each one of these other folks have been in solitary for extended period of times. Eight years, 10 years, 14 years, 29 years, that's uh, Robert King, and 44 years, one of the Angola three. Uh, between them, these people have 105 years of solitude. And I wanna underscore that these are the survivors. These are the people who live to tell the tale. They are 
there are countless people who have tried to kill themselves, who have completely fallen apart in the process. So in fact, uh, a gentleman called uh, Haney, I think Chris Haney, um, has been following people to look at the psychological, and it's very well documented that there are severe, as you might expect, constant chronic psychological problems associated with uh, solitary confinement. In addition, the Center for Constitutional Rights commissioned a study from Stanford University, um, Human Rights and Trauma Mental Health Group, um, and it got released in November 2017, looking systematically at the impact of this. And their goal was to investigate against psychological harm. Everybody in their study had had 10 years or more of solitary. Again, they point that this is probably only resilient people who are there because they were are still around A and B willing to interact and tell about this. And they identified a number of clinically recognizable disorders, depression, major depressive disorder, including anger, irritability, and hedonia, meaning not like seeking pleasure, fatigue, guilt, loss of ap appetite, sleep problems, but also panic, PTSD, heart rate, respiration rate, a lot of physical changes, which is important, intrusive thoughts and fear of losing control, and on many other dimensions of dysregulation, including numbing and feeling desensitized, which is really important, and loss of attention, concentration, and memory, and the sense of being socially completely burnt out and uninterested, losing the motivation to even interact with another human being. That, that just gets pounded right out of you. So there is a lot of psychological documentation, but again, the concept of cruel and unusual punishment was critical. So this is for me was a turning place when I met this gentleman. I met him in Chicago at a AAAS meeting. We were having the first a discussion from different angles about solitary confinement. We had dinner together the night before in order to just see who's going to talk about what. This gentleman was there and he was completely silent throughout the dinner. Um, he had been late, he had gotten lost coming to meet us even within the hotel. So he was, we were all in the big hired hotel there. He had gotten lost and we finally met up and he sat completely silent. I decided I wanted to talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, so we decided to walk back on this cold, chilly Chicago night in like February or something. Uh, it was dedication. And I um, started just talking to him. I tried to be kind of gentle with him. And he started uh, telling me, you know, people ask him what he thought and what he felt, but it was almost 30 years, he felt all kinds of things. He thought and stopped thinking all kinds of things. How can he describe it? So I said, tell me something physical that you think happened to you while you were there. And he said, well, the first thing that happened is my vision started being problem. I felt like I was losing my sense of depth perception. I, and I, I went to see the doctor in the prison and he told me that happens to a lot of people in solitary because there is no room to focus. You're always focusing really nearby and they lose their ability to control their eyes. And the other thing he said is I said, oh, that's really interesting. What did you do? He said I would sit there and see if I could look through the walls and imagine, you know, a world beyond the walls and try to work on my eyes. And the other thing he told me is he gets lost all the time, which I already knew because he got lost just finding the lobby. And I thought, ha ha, hippocampus. We'll talk about that in a second. But I said, you know what? We have a press conference tomorrow. Just say these two things and I will take it from there. Because to me, I needed a hook to say it's physical. It's changing the brain. And so he was my kind of first inspiration for how we could construct a neuroscience argument 
towards why this is cruel and unusual punishment. So, you know, we, we all love the brain, you know, we, we know it's an amazing organ. I want to just talk a little bit about why we, it makes sense to think about what what it does and how it could go wrong. So, you know, we know all the different functions of the brain, right? Like whether you're relaxing and breathing, whether you're eating or, you know, listening to music or moving, dancing, you know, enjoying a scene, it's all important, but it's also equally critical for social interactions, for social bonding, for short and long-term relationship and play, critical. Uh, aspect of brain health and brain function. And the point is that the brain has some key needs. It evolved in order to do certain things. It needs to control the body and its own function, the brain itself. It needs to look at the outside world and as importantly, extremely importantly, it can't be static because the world is always changing. And the more complicated you are as a creature, the less programmed your behavior is, the more your brain needs to be able to change. So and importantly, it has evolved so that it needs to perform these functions. It's not just that it can do them. And the argument is that extended solitary confinement impacts all these facets. You can't control your body anymore, you can't monitor the outside world, and you don't have the room to change in a healthy, positive way because the, the world is complex and dynamic around you. So, of course, we know that the brain controls behaviors. We know that there are many elements that go into the creation of a healthy brain, from the genetics of it, the developmental, the hormonal things that hit in adolescence, <laughs> But the environment is absolutely critical. I know you all know that. I'm just a reminder to, for contextualizing this. And a big part of the action is the one I am emphasizing, which is this ongoing brain remodeling, which can always go either well or badly. That is the point, that it's not static, and that's the fork. Is it going to go in a positive direction? Are you going to keep learning and changing and adapting, or are, are you going to let it fall apart? And so all, as neuroscientists, we think at multiple levels of organization, from whole brain function to brain circuitry that kind of mediates particular tasks through the individual cells and the way they talk to each other, to the machinery within the inside of each cell that writes this program and then can get modified. And the, what, what I'm underscoring here is behavior, including depression, but in animal and in human, can remodel things at each one of these levels. So you can change the activity of neurons and amount of chemical transmitters and gene activity within single neurons. You can change the way the circuit is functioning. You can change long-term connectivity ability across the entire brain. So since no perfect study has been done, uh, what I'm going to tell you for the rest of the talk is about two lines of evidence that one can use about why solitary confinement hurts the brain. One, it depends on animals, where you can directly study isolation and manipulate the environment and look at the impact. And, the, uh, and these, by the way, were not done as models of human solitary confinement. They are just extraction of information that's done in the course of doing neuroscience in general. And the other are human studies associated with the conditions that you know, result from solitary confinement, especially depression, which is a big major thing, and anxiety disorders. So I said hippocampus before when I heard from him, and that's this lovely structure that looks like a seahorse, hence the name, buried deep into the human brain, very nicely conserved across species, very beautiful structure. I showed you a little picture of it earlier, like a jelly roll, where we know a lot. And it's an area where the current president of the SOC, Rusty Gage, has had huge influence because he studied neurogenesis or the ongoing birth of new cells it's one of the few places in the brain where neurogenesis or continuing cell birth happens even in adults. 
Um, and so what is interesting about the hippocampus is that it, so I, I, I call it sometimes the concierge of the brain. If you live in a fancy building in Manhattan, you need a, 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 a presence that monitor, knows all that's going on on the inside, monitors the outside, decides what can come in and what can't, how to shunt things, who to remember, who to forget, who to eliminate, and so on. The hippocampus kind of, so a lot of people think about it in terms of space and memory. We think about it in terms of stress in our group, but the point is broader than this. It sits at that interface between the outside world and the rest of the functions of the brain, and it monitors what is important. And what is important is a number of things. One is context, physical, spatial context, because boy, if you're in the wrong place, you're an animal, you can die. And if you're in the right place, that's really good. So that has valence, it's not just, you know, you know, uh, a GPS device, it has emotions associated with it. It monitors stress because I just told you that the context is never neutral, really hardly ever neutral. Um, and, and then it decides what should be committed to memory. So it's involved in remembering short term and then shipping information for longer term storage elsewhere in the brain. So I find that that's a helpful way of integrating all the different actions of the hippocampus and thinking about how then it can be altered. And one of the things we know extremely well is that the hippocampus has stress sensitive neurons that are contain receptors for the stress hormones, glucocorticoids, and that chronic stress kills the hippocampus. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But a couple of things to remind you about the spatial aspect. There was a Nobel Prize about this not too long ago, about how the brain is, has its own GPS device that does this really cool thing of specific cells, know where you are in space, only respond if you are in this particular spot and not in another spot as you're taking a walk, if you're a mouse. A particular cell responds here, a different set of cells respond here. The way around the cortex, there is a 3D uh, rendition of this so that you have like a, a, a sense of the entire volume of the space. I'm sure you've heard about these a long ago finding about taxi drivers in, in um, London who have a pretty large hippocampus. The better the, their cabbie, the bigger their hippocampus because they need to remember their space. Sadly, if they stop driving, their hippocampus shrinks back. Uh, so, you know, so the hippocampus, as I said, is while it's important in exploring context, exploration is often emotionally charged. And I want to show you how that is controlled in that region. And one of the tests that is often used in neuroscience, I make the analogy to this bridge called the Mile High Bridge, what is it now, North Carolina, where, which swings a little bit in the, it's pretty uh, open below it. And if you step on it, it just starts swinging. And you can see some human beings love it and run up and down it, and other people are like standing here, and I like think, I think I stood here. So uh, you can measure how far you're willing to go out on a limb. Well, we have an, a, an equivalent of that called the elevated plus maze where you have a closed kind of protected side and an open side. And we can, elect, and we can take an animal and put this optogenetic probe where we're using light to stimulate particular cells in particular places in the hippocampus and watch how they uh, explore the space, and I'm worried that, uh, oh man, it did not transmit. Uh, I, it did not transmit. Um, somehow it got lost. You can, you can see this animal running around, and he has a certain rate of exploration in the open arms. Then if you turn the laser on, he starts running in the open space like crazy, immediately, instantaneously. It's like 
you remove fear or inhibition and the animal explores like crazy. So, the, as I said, this area for exploration is sensitive to stress. And one of the things that we know is that it can alter the actual physical nature and structure of nerve cells in that area. So nerve cells, for example, have these spines on them, which are little bitty protuberances that, that, that uh, move, actually, if you're looking at them in actual, you know, under a microscope, you can see them moving, and they're seeking and interacting and changing shape with the neighbors, interacting with the neighbors. And if you actually stress animals, you can change that. So the stress system chronically uh, can harm the brain by actually either creating insufficient activity or actual damage at that level. So one word about the stress system, I've kind of been alluding to it, but basically our brains take information from the environment and compute whether it's something feels safe or unsafe, alarming or not alarming, familiar, unfamiliar. It could be even stressful when it's good. That information gets funneled to the hypothalamus, which releases CRH, which was discovered here at the SOC. And um, then that releases another stress hormone, ACTH, which triggers the amygdala uh, uh, to the adrenal gland, <laughs> amygdala, triggers the adrenal gland to, to release these stress hormones called corticosteroids. Corticosteroids do a lot of things. They, change your sugar metabolism, they give you energy, they help you decisions about flight or flight. And the other things they do is they go back and tell the brain that they are there, they are high. And when they go to the brain, they literally move from the cell. So this is the steroid receptors now, the receptors that are bathing in a, a condition where there is no steroid hormone. The moment steroid hormones hit they all move into the nucleus, the center of the cell, and interact with the DNA in the cell and start changing the activity of a whole bunch of genes. So literally, stress can get back into your body all over, but also your brain, and change gene activity at the cellular level. And one of the things it does change is the spine and synapses. I'm showing you an actual brain cells in the background of my talk. And these spine of synapses that are altered by stress. So this is what a hippocampus looks like uh, under normal circumstances. This is where the new cell birth is happening. This is what a rendition of what level of spines and connections and dendrites there are on a neuron. But following chronic stress, they become very denuded. They lose literally their branching. So this is one kind of physical damage that can happen from chronic stress. And of course, once you see that, you can see the effect on all kinds of other things because this area controls emotion, depression, but also is really important, as I said, in learning and memory. Numerous animal studies tell us that context matters, that this context that the hippocampus is computing and sensing matters in a variety of ways. And funnily enough, a lot of them are accidental findings because a lot of people do their science in the context of doing their studies. Um, they're putting fancy equipment, like I put this optogenetic probe to electrically stimulate a particular part of the hippocampus. Well, that's a pretty fancy piece of equipment. You put a bunch of mice together and they start tearing it out of each other's head. That doesn't make anybody happy. And so you put an animal, you separate an animal in order to do your study. Well, some people put them away for a week, and others a set for two weeks, some for three weeks, and then the con experiment continues while they are living alone. So this isolation is not just beforehand, but it is ongoing. And people don't really worry too much about it because they think the animal is briefly stressed by early isolation, and then they get used to it and it's all over. And some of the blood measures, kind of if you're superficial about it, support this idea. But we inadvertently discovered how much duration matter, even if you prolong the isolation 
for one week. That's all we were doing here in the background of another study. This is the steroid hormone cortico corticosterone in the rat. This is how much the response is um, after seven days of isolation versus two weeks of isolation. You get a bigger stress response. This is not because the adrenal is misfunctioning. It's coming from higher up. This is ACTH, which comes from the brain through the, through the pituitary gland. You can see you're getting double the amount of stress hormone uh, after two weeks of isolation. So this might lead you to underestimate that there's quite a bit of churning going on in that, in that stress system, even with one additional week of living alone, if you're a mouse. Moreover, and very importantly, when you challenge this animal with an external stressor, in this case, it was like a, an injection of saline, so it's simple stressor. Still, an animal that's been in isolation for one week gives you a sturdy stress response, which peaks at one hour and then fades by six hours. When it's been isolated for two weeks, even that ability to mount a stress response has diminished. And in the brain, I'm not showing you, we know why all of this is happening. We know what the receptors are doing in the brain, what the, what the triggers are doing, the integrators and all of that. I'm not going into it. But the point is, this is a blunted response to stress. So this animal is walking around with a higher level of circulating stress hormones, but cannot mount a further stress response. That combination we see in human depression. And an extra week of isolation exacerbates it. So you can imagine years and years of stuff. More importantly, these animals become anxious. So this is in how often you enter in the open arms of that elevated plus maze and how much time you spend. And this is, again, literally just taking a mouse for a week alone, two weeks alone. You can see how much more anxious they become. They're less interested in exploring, and they're more interested in being um, you know, in a safe place on their own. So, you, so I've already told you that, and I haven't shown you all the activity changes in stress, but the blunting, the other thing I have not told you is the circadian rhythm is really messed up in these animals. So there are lots of genes that oscillate, I will show you in the human in a minute, that oscillate in a circadian manner, that is, uh, st starts to go off between one week and two weeks of social isolation. The other part is this, the inter-individual contact. So I'm saying social because there's no animals, but so let's think a little bit more about what even rodents do with each other. Well, so I mean, I showed you how kids play with each other. Well, but rodents care about each other. So if you have a rodent alone, you put it in a brand new place especially if it has a certain kind of genetic background, which we study, they tend to be distressed. You put another rodent with it, and it's a lot happier. And we can measure that because we measure these ultrasonic vocalizations that they emit. We can't hear them, but we can detect them with a, a special device. And how much they chirp. There is like a, a sad chirp and a happy chirp. The happy chirp, for example, you can amplify it if you give them cocaine. They chirp like crazy. So you can see that in a new environment, they need to explore the happy chirping goes up if they have a buddy compared to if they are on their own. And so it actually increases positive chirping, decreases negative chirping just to have a buddy. One thing that we have done is also, as uh, I alluded, genetically been breeding animals that have somewhat different temperament. And it's based on this question, what, what is your idea of fun? Do you like to sit at home knitting? Or do you like to go skydiving? To take two extremes, you might hate both, but you know, these are the extremes. <laughs> so we've been using rats, not mice here, but rats, and we created basically <laughs> knitting and skydiving animals genetically. They are, this is, this is really, it turns out, genetic wired, you can genetically breed like you breed dogs for certain features, you can breed rats for loving risk or hating risk, and, and it affects all kinds of things like whether they're willing to take drugs of abuse, or take, uh, become anxious, depressed, how they learn, all kinds of stuff. So 
It looks very simple. You can take an animal, put it in a new place with an object in the middle. Some animals are very conservative. They just hug the walls, never make it all the way around. Some animals go crazy with excitement, chirping and happy and explore. These are the low responders, high responders. I'm using a traffic light kind of uh, code where red is stop and green is go. And we breed them genetically, a female of this type to a male of this type, and female and a male of this type, we breed them. And you know, they separate very dramatically. So within, within a few generations, we can be 100% sure that they're gonna have you know, baby skydivers and baby knitters. And, uh, and, and uh, as I indicated, we have a lot of neurobiology about them. But it, even behaviorally, you can see that the low responders, for example, never hardly ever go out on this open arm of the elevated plus mate, whereas the others spend their time evenly. I want to show you one, I'm uh, bleeding up to one study that has to do with social context. So our high and low responders respond very differently to fear. You condition a sound to a mild shock in a room and they start hating the sound like Pavlov would have done, except it's negative. So the anxious animals, the knitting animals, learn it very quickly and they freeze. As soon as you put them, they get conditioned and they freeze. But even when you take them to a new context, a completely different room, and you let them hear the sound and you're trying to teach them that in this context, the sound is safe. This is what you're trying to teach soldiers that are coming from war, that not every loud sound means that you're gonna get you know, blown up, that there are a car can be backfiring in your neighborhood and it's safe. So you're teaching them to differentiate context. These animals cannot learn context very well and they stay frozen compared to their buddies or to animals you buy on, you know, from your local supplier who learn to eventually calm down in a new context. So that's called lack of extinction, absence of extinction. But there is something you can do to change that. These studies are done, so each animal is in a separate room, in, in a separate cage, in a big room where animals are sitting and just hearing the sound that they had associated with a bad thing, now trying to learn that it's a good thing. It, it turns out it depends who is sitting in the other cages in that room, even though they can't see them. If animals that are sitting are a mix of high and low responders, this is the response you get, but if it's only made up of others like you, then you do learn to calm down a little bit. So even though they don't see them, just having somebody in the neighborhood who is kind of like you helps you calm down fear, extinguish fear. And we know a lot about the brain pathways that are involved in this. So this is social support, the importance of social interactions and social support, even subliminally in a way. And the other is the richness of the environment. That's physical as opposed to just whether one animal is in there, but how many interesting objects. So this is a study that we have done where we start adding toys. So instead of their living their boring lives in their cages, we put them in these bigger cages and we are told, can you see the rat in here as a rat? They start running around. And it turns out it makes a huge difference even if you are born to be a very anxious knitter that usually you don't want to go around and explore anything. It really dramatically changes their anxiety, increases their willing to explore. And it also increases the positive chirps that I told you about. So this is Acutely, if you just put them in a novel bear environment, this is the high responder, the active ones, these are the more passive ones. You do it again, keep doing it, you know, every day, nothing really changed. These guys the, that do these positive chirps are really excited the first time. They get bored after a while, so they do give you fewer chirps, because like that's not new anymore. But these poor knitters there, they just like, nah. Nothing. But if there is a complex environment, if it's in a complex environment, you can see 
that it really helps these usually anxious inhibited animals. They start chirping positively. They catch up with these other guys who had gotten bored. They, so it matters a lot. This is like you're taking animals that are really different like light and day and you're making them much more similar because one got bored and the other felt comforted and excited because of the novelty and the number of objects around them. So basically, this is the, my overall take on the animal studies, is how much context matters. It matters because isolation is really negative. It changes the stress system. It changes many genes in the brain. It changes circadian rhythms. It, it, it makes you bathe in stress hormones in an undifferentiated way while unable to mount a proper stress response. It matters in handling emotions like fear. I showed you an example of fear and how much it matters to who your neighbors are. And I showed you the importance of an enriched social environment. So all of this you can try and extend to the human, but you can also ask what do we know in humans that could inform us about the solitary confinement question. And you remember that we said there are a couple of major findings, including clinical major depressive disorders and anxiety disorders. Well, I happen to be part of a consortium that studies the brain of depressed people uh, and other psychiatric disorders. It's called the Pritzker Neuropsychiatric Research Consortium, which is the same Pritzkers, which is how I get my invitation to the, <laughs> to the architecture pride. And it's a consortium that includes us at Michigan, Stanford, UC Irvine, Cornell, and a genetics institute called Hudson Alpha Institute. And we are interested in using all kinds of tools, genetic, neurobiological, gene expression, and animal models in understanding this. And we look at the brain very broadly. We don't pretend that we know where these disorders are. So this is bipolar illness, major depression, and schizophrenia. But we try and get as anatomically precise as possible so that we can label the specific cells we're looking at. This is in my husband's lab, Watson lab. Different like, for example, peptides in the human um, hippocampus so that we can pick out what happens. And I don't know if this will show. I think my, my movies got stripped somehow. But you can see in 3D, it's really beautiful. This a method called clarity. So, but the sum total of a lot of studies gave me a, an impression of the depressed brain that I really, would, I really had not anticipated. And the best way I can define it is this, that the depressed brain is like the change between a, a tree in spring and a tree in winter. The structure may be the same, but with the amount of activity and connectivity and all of that is really severely, severely diminished. So instead of thinking that this is one brain circuit that's defective or one set of chemicals or one set of genes that aren't active, it really made me realize that this is a brain-wide, systems-wide disorder. Some regions are more hurt than others, but pretty much every region you look at in the severely depressed brain is affected. It looks like an unhealthy brain. It has many different pathways that have to do with maintenance of cell health that are dysregulated. At the same time, there are regions of the brain that are implicated in emotionality that are very severely, more than other areas, impacted. So one of them is the human amygdala, where we dissected 10 different amygdala regions, nuclei of the amygdala, so that's a lot of work from each human brain. And, and here is a, re, uh, so here is like one area of the amygdala that's like devastated by depression. So when you actually, these are individual subjects and you look, we're looking at the profile of genetic activity, gene expression pattern. So all the activity of genes in those brain regions are depicted in one kind of dot here, and these are major components that are affecting them. And you can see the clustering. So you can see that the control subjects have one kind of signature, and a big majority of the depressed people 
have a very distinctive signature. A few depressed people are somewhere in between. But we can pretty much diagnose depression, um, you know, if, if you're blind, pretty much diagnose it with 95% accuracy, just looking at the, the loss of, uh, you know, activity in a lot of genes in that brain region. The other one is the hippocampus that I've been talking about. Very old studies by Yvette Shaheen and, uh, Shaleen and others have focused with neuroimaging on the hippocampus and were pursued. And she looked simply at the volume of the hippocampus, the total volume, and showed that the more days you spend with your depression untreated, so this is like 10 years of depression, the smaller your hippocampus. So this is an example of that disease literally shrinking that part of your brain. And remember, people, some people were in solitude a whole lot longer than that. So when we look at the human brain, we see changes in many genes in depression, as I mentioned. I'm going to focus on a couple. One is on the circadian changes. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go fast, but we all know there are circadian rhythms. They are important. But nobody had looked directly in the human brain. And so what we did in this study is we took people based on what time of day they happened to die and said how many hours given sunrise on that day in that place at that time of the year. And so this is a person who died three hours after sunrise or two hours before sunrise. And so they're lined up here. And then we looked at all the genes in their brain, how active they are when we do this gene expression profiling, where we're profiling multiple brain regions, and we're looking at every gene that's active in the brain, all at the same time. And we can pick out if there is a cycle, if it matters what time somebody died. And in fact, you can see cycling. So each one of those is the activity of that gene in that patient. That same gene in another patient who died five hours later, or 10 hours later. And you can see that depending on when somebody died, that gene changes its activity. So in spite of all the difference between how people died and all kinds of stuff, they, these genes are tracking. These are clock genes. And they are tracking when the person dies, what time of day. In fact, there are many more genes than the clock genes that track. There are about 1,000 genes throughout the brain that literally are tracking the time of day. And you can see whether you, you, you can, I, I will show you that in a second. So, so what happens in depression is that this rhythm disappears. So these numbers show that it's a significant sinusoidal curve that fits a 24 hour rhythm in the controls. These are all clock genes and they all stop, go back to being flat all but one are flattened in depressed brains, as if you know, there is no time of day. So in fact, we can take the pattern of these genes and tell when somebody died within an hour, if you're a normal person. So there is a timestamp on the brain of the normal person, say, they died two hours after sunrise. And we can tell that we are pretty accurate. But if you're depressed, it's like you've traveled to China. This work has been actually uh, uh, followed up by others and replicated, which always makes me happy. So there is this disrupted activity with gel genes. And obviously, this system is very critical. I think there are going to be more comments on it. But remember how disrupted it's going to be if you're seeing four inches of an inner courtyard or absolutely no window, no normal light for years on end. The other one I want to quickly touch on is this growth factor. Just to introduce that we have things called growth factors that are important, that they are changed dramatically in depression. I'm just speeding up a little bit because I want to give you a few minutes if you have questions. But basically, this is not, these, this is in blue are the depressed people. And if they were on antidepressants before they died, you can see some amelioration compared to control, but not going all the way fully back to normal. A lot of people also have replicated our findings, and we asked, what is this functionally relevant? So we did a whole suite of studies 
on the role of this particular growth factor, FGF2, and its receptor in back in animal models and asked, is this really important? And I am going to just summarize here and say, it really turns out to be important as a vulnerability gene, as a developmental gene, as a uh, gene that responds to stress, responds to a rich environment, and it's critical in this neural remodeling, including in neurogenesis, in the remodeling of the hippocampus. So I'm skipping a bunch, but the, this is a cool study that shows that if you knock it out of the hippocampus, you know, you, you, you like turn down the activity of that gene in the hippocampus, you make animals more anxious. So it's there all the time controlling our anxiety. The other thing I want to show you, it affects neurogenesis. I want to show you the school finding where we've taken our knitters and skydivers and we've given them one shot of this growth factor the day after birth and we let them grow up and we partially ameliorated the inhibited uh, pattern of behavior in those low responders. So this is how much time the high responders go on the open arm of, the, of that maze. This is how much time the low responders do. They're really scared. If you give neonatal FGF2 and wait till adulthood, it doesn't change these high responders. They're already crazy. These low responders re become more like a normal animal. So you can see that this is one growth factor, one of several, that's remodeling the brain, remodeling temperament. And the reason I'm telling you all about it is this is one of the growth factor that disappears during isolation that drops down. So when you're isolating animals, you're turning down the tone of these growth factors that affect emotion, that affect anxiety, and that help remodel the brain. So I'm gonna end by having just a, a couple of thought experiments. Um, you know, like what would be the ideal study if we wanted to prove without a doubt that um, isolation matters in hurting the brain. It can't be carried out for lots of reasons. We're not allowed to do too many biological studies on prisoners. But even if it were that, the question, you'd have to catch somebody before and then after isolation and study them. If you can do that, maybe it is useful. And you need to compare it to something. And if you're comparing it to the population at large, it's one story. If you're copy, co comparing it to people who stay in the general uh, prison population, that's very stressful in its own way, in its own right. So it's hard to know how to compare it. More importantly, it's, um, you know, it's the duration, the individual differences matters. I showed you the importance of individual differences. And it would not be that one, everybody's gonna respond the same way. Our friend said his eyes went away, he lost his uh, sense of direction. Others might be severely depressed, others might be very angry, and so you'd have to look all over the brain. But I think, I hope I've convinced you that, that th this, this, these conditions are very likely to create very severe changes in brain structure and function. And uh, I hope that there is a way that we can come together at the level of different fields and see the law, neuroscience, but also architecture, and think about at least, even if we're not going to change who is going to be isolated, are there ways to make it more humane? Are there ways where it, it doesn't hurt anybody, to, but it helps that human being to actually see light or have a certain kind of space. We can talk about experiments in other countries where they've done something along these lines. So I wanna leave you with almost a little challenge about how we can do better as humans without necessarily even annihilating you know, the whole procedure. So I wanna end by thanking you for your attention. I don't know, is there questions? Mm -hmm. um, th there's a couple minutes for um, some questions. 
Do you have the, yeah. Um, and most then, monks sometimes go for a year and sit in a cave and meditate. What do you think happens to their brains? The, 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 the people who voluntarily isolate themselves. You know, but they're I, not only just isolating, but they're doing, their brain is very active in watching yeah. what's I going think, on inside. I think, first of all, I imagine it matters a lot if you choose to do it versus it is done to you. Because, in, you know, if I did not define stress, but stress, I, I define stress as lack of control, lack of predictability. And so if you're picking the process and you're predicting how long you want to stay or you plan it, I think that's already a lot less stressful. And so, in fact, when you talk to people, like I've started to talk to all these people about how they survived, they try to go into kind of a Zen situation and see if they can make it something else. So, but I think in that particular case, to be more direct, it, I don't know, but it might be that they're cutting down on activity in certain areas of the brain while they're trying to enhance others that they are working on, but that, I'm just speculating. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work on this obviously critical human rights issue. Uh, I, I do have a question because as architects, we are often working with uh, clients and then also users, and those are frequently not the same people. Right. In this case, the users would be the victims and survivors of solitary confinement, but the clients could be argued as various figures, including um, jail yeah. uh, and prison managers and guards. Right. The, the amount of work, this is the second uh, presentation at ANFA where there's been a focus on jail and prison design and solitary uh, um, confinement and the detrimental effects. I don't think anyone in this room would argue that there are obviously terrible impacts of this kind of treatment. At what point, or are there currently uh, studies on the psychology or neuroscience of the people, those clients, the, the jail um, guards yeah. and prison guards? So, so, because what, what we need as architects is a viable solution. We can't just say, no, you can't have solitary yeah, yeah, confinement. Yeah. No, I get, I get your question. So Thank this you. meeting in Pittsburgh where I showed you the um, images of the actual examples of people like that, that was really fascinating, fascinating because it brought in heads of prison systems and people who had been head guards in big facilities that were pretty raucous. The first speaker was an amazing man who was the head, I think, of Denver prison system, who was, came in after his predecessor had been murdered by a prisoner who was let go. But that, that predecessor had believed in human rights. The family of that predecessor talked to this man and said, don't go so harsh as to undo all the work of our father, husband, and so on. So he was trying to find a fine line between how you keep things safe, but in a humane way. And there was discussion also with people from Scandinavian countries about how to do it. And a lot depends also on the personalities of the guards and the culture that you create, whether this is an antagonistic culture or not. So there is thought in this area about how to rethink, reconceive the role of prison and the relationship within it from the legal point of view. It's, these are horrible jobs to have. People burn out. But I think finding the right partners as a proof of concept between architecture and law enforcement and bringing some neuroscience into it would be fantastic. Um, hi. Here. Um, I, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm thinking about the point you made in the last slide about making these environments more humane. And I just wanted to share, because you also, you also mentioned the, the suit that was brought against Pelican Bay. Mm -hmm. I was actually hired by the California Department of Corrections uh, with the charge to 
tell them what they could do to make Pelican Bay more humane. Oh, fantastic. And I know, but it's not a great story. I, I got as far as delivering a review of the literature to them, where many of the factors that you mentioned, including natural light, more social stimulation, more time out of the cell, because really they're there because they've violated some really serious rule or, or committed some very serious offense and haven't behaved well, so they're hard to control. Anyway, we, we, we suggested all those things to them, and the next step was for me to go visit and see what it actually looked like. I'd only seen plans and pictures, and they chickened out. <laughs> they, and I think it might have had something to do with the lawsuit. Uh, they didn't want, at that point, to admit that they knew what they could do to do better. Yeah. So they canceled the project. So. Gosh, I mean, there's so many things to discuss about it, but... Um, I don't know having, if there is room yeah, for advocacy. I mean, one question is whether there is room for advocacy, if there is a vision that um, can be put together that is multidisciplinary, that would have lawyers and architects and, and neuroscientists and psychologists and say, we could do better. Even if we don't, we're not out there saying nobody should ever be in isolation. But it shouldn't be open-ended, like it may be that, you know, there is a way out. And if there is a way out, coming out of uh, isolation into the general population is extremely traumatic. This person who's completely burnt out now is with violent, you know, angry people and it's horrible going out in the real world. So there's so many aspects to this, but I actually believe this is a place where a, 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 a vision would be helpful to at least begin to approximate. You know, maybe not right now, but over time, a couple of areas. California is the place to do it.